is this the right boat for you? Today, we're going to start with a beautiful 2024 Denosa Odyssey 410. Uh, we're going to do a walkthrough of the boat and uh, take it into consideration if I was a cruiser. So I'm going to show you uh, what are the things that I'm looking at when I'm looking at a boat like this, if I want to do coastal cruising or do a transatlantic cruising, as this is a 41-foot boat. The other thing, on the second half of the video, we're going to be talking by the numbers. So we're going to look at the capacity this boat has and do some calculations as to how many days can we run with that capacity without having to replenish. So that'll, that'll give you kind of a range and an idea of if you get on this boat and load it up, how long can you be at sea before you have to pull into port? and do some replenishing. With that, let's just get started. Let's start with the basic. Everybody wants a bathroom, correct? Now, the heads on boats are come in two flavors. One is a wet head and one is a dry head. The wet head means that whenever you take a shower, uh, the whole floor of the bathroom is gonna get wet. Uh, a dry head means that you can take a shower without getting everything else on the head soaking wet. Here's another important consideration when you're talking about heads. People shower very little on the heads that come with their boats. Now, let's be realistic. Whenever you're out at sea and you're cruising, chances of you taking a shower on the, in the head, you know, but sorry, in the head, are slight to very, very slim. Unless you're in a cold climate where it's too cold to jump in the water, Typically, what you're going to do is you're going to jump overboard. You know, back here on the back of the boat, you're going to come out. You're going to soap up with Joy, um, Mr. Bubbles, whatever you, you like to use to, to clean yourself up. You're going to jump back in the water. And then you're going to use the outside shower to basically just rinse off the salt water and you're done. You're clean. It's what's going to conserve the most amount of water uh, when you're out cruising. And water is a limited resource on a sailboat, which you have to keep in mind. This is what your shower looks like when it's tucked away. You have hot and cold on the faucet and your hose. And then you have a nice cover to keep it all tucked away. Now, if you happen to be at a marina where you have water accessible and you want to take long showers, you can use your head. But if you notice, there is no divider on the floor of the boat. So whenever you're taking a shower, water is going to come and get pretty much everything wet. So if I was going to take a shower on this head, things to consider is I'm a big guy. So all of the doors inside of a boat are going to be smaller. So you're going to, you know, unless you're really skinny, you can walk straight through. If not, you're going to turn sideways to get in. Now, once inside, on this particular boat, I have a door. And the door basically keeps water from splashing into the toilet area. So I'm in the shower stall. You can see the shower up here. It's a hose so you can move it. And you have your sink where's, where is the source of the water. And here's where you open and close the water for the shower. And that's where your sink. But if you can see my feet, I'm standing inside, but there's a gap underneath the door. So the water is still gonna run out, but it won't run out into the cabin. So while having the door is a nice add-on on this shower, uh, basically it doesn't keep the water out of the head. So this is a wet head, regardless of how you look at it. What it does though is if somebody wants to use the toilet while you're taking a shower, you can keep water splashing to a minimum. This is a full size toilet, which are very nice. You know, in older boats, you're going to have something that's about two thirds of that. And you have electric flush, which is kind of nice. Now, this boat has two heads. So let's go check out the head on the master stateroom. So in here, you're going to have the same scenario. You have to step in. Close the door. Once this door is closed, you have your shower area next to your sink with your hose. And you have the glass door that you can close, but you're still going to have the gap in the bottom. So again, what these doors are doing is just keeping water from going into the toilet if you have somebody that's using it. 
um, keeping the toilet paper dry, which goes right there. But in reality, you're quickly going to find out that most sailors shower outside of the boat. Now, the other aspect of the bathroom, I'm going to call it the bathroom, even though we call it a head at sea, is the toilet. And all of the waste that goes in the toilet has to go into a holding tank when you are uh, inside of three miles from shore. You cannot drop your, your business uh, outside of the boat uh, as you're sailing only after you have gone out three miles or more. You have a holding tank and if you're doing coastal cruising, meaning staying within three miles of shore, you're going to have to carry that with you. And I'll talk about the numbers in a little bit so you know how many times you can use the bathroom for how many days before you fill up your tank. Other things that create a, a limitation or, you know, it's going to give you a specific um, range for your boat or the boat that you're looking at is the water capacity. Why? Because you use water for drinking, you use water for showering. If you have a fresh water toilet, you're using fresh water to wash your toilet and you use water to do your dishes. So understanding how much water you're going to consume on a trip it's important because you want to conserve as much water as you possibly can. Let's talk about another aspect of sailing, which is your galley. So key considerations with a galley is how much room do I have to store food? How much refrigeration capacity do I have? And what kind of a stove uh, do I have available for cooking? Because more than likely on probably 90% of the boats, they're going to come with a propane stove. On some modern boats, they're starting to put more induction because there's more battery capacity available. But let's say, for the sake of argument, it's all going to be propane. So let's take a look at this boat and see what we got. So from a storage capacity, it has this nice slide-on um, storage shelf, and it has an additional shelf on top. It has additional storage sh uh, shelving on this side. Of the galley and it has a very deep locker uh, to store additional stores. You also have a spot down here for pots and pans. On this particular boat you're gonna have a two burner stove. Sometimes they come three, sometimes they come four with an oven and it's all propane so if you cook every day you can figure your tank is probably gonna last you you know, depending on how long you cook, uh, let's say on a good side, let's say 20 days. The next thing to talk about is a refrigerator. This is a 6.3 cubic feet uh, refrigerator. And it has a little uh, freezer area here. Not very big. So you're not going to be able to have, you know, uh, 20 pounds of steaks and pork chops and things like that store in here frozen so you're probably going to have some goods on this particular boat or you may get an external freezer to keep frozen foods you have a lot of storage and in this boat they did a very nice job of putting slider baskets which can be removed so you can get to the bottom of the fridge and we'll talk about the numbers uh here in a sec so keeping food refrigerated and packed, you have to be smart about how, how you buy your food. So knowing that uh, refrigerator space is limited, you probably don't want to buy gallons of milk or gallons of orange juice or things like that. You probably want to buy a smaller size, either concentrate juices, if you want to have them, uh, or dry milk, either powder or non-refrigerated milk, because those are the things that are going to take the most amount of space. So for the meats, uh, meat that you're going to use right away, you can probably keep on the fridge side. Meat that's going to sit for, you know, several days, you want to put on the freezer. So you have to be smart about what kind of food you get. If you're going to be fishing and eating fresh fish as you cruise, then that's phenomenal. Basically, you catch it, you clean it, you eat it, and you're done with it. You don't have to store it. So I'll have a section by the numbers here shortly. Comfort at sea is going to be important because you're going to be sleeping on the boat. So on some boats, you're going to have what's called a centerline berth, which means that you can crawl in from both sides of the bed. Uh, on other boats, is because of the design, you're not going to have that option. You're going to be climbing through the foot of the bed to lay down. So on the Juno 410, you have a step to climb up. 
but you don't have any room on the side. So you're going to be crawling in bed, you know, from the foot up. Now you have space to put your books or maybe put some water at night. You have privacy windows, so you can slide those to create more privacy. And you have storage at the head of the bed. But this is going to be a bed where you're going to be crawling in from the foot of the bed. You're not going to be able to get around. Same applies on the aft cabins. You're going to be crawling into bed from the end, the long end of the bed. You can see it on both sides. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just uh, for the design of the boat, they chose to set the cabin layout that way. So, again, you know, you're crawling from the long side and other boats are going to crawling from the side of the bed. It's going to be different on every boat. Another consideration when you're looking to see if this is the right boat for you is to think about your cabin height. Now, this boat on this area of the salon has a 6'5 cabin height. So there's plenty of room. I'm six foot tall. So I have plenty of headroom. Uh, the reason that's important is because it, if you're too close to the liner, it's going to feel cramped. If it's lower, you're going to be hunching over, and that's not going to be good for your back. So you want to find a boat that you fit meaning it's tall enough that to give you plenty of walking space. Now, the, the space on this boat, it has a declining cabin, cabin top. So when I get to the stateroom back here, I only have an inch because this is six one on this side. So these are things to consider as you're evaluating the boat. The, the sitting on the boat is also going to be important because you're probably going to spend most of your time here in the salon. On some boats, they give you, you know, I'm sure some of you have seen the giant uh, king-sized bed on the stern of the boat, and everybody's crazy about that. Reality is, you're not going to spend that much time back there. More than likely, you're going to spend most of your time here, or you're going to spend most of your time outside. And so having the most amount of space available and having the sitting area to be comfortable uh, on the salon is critical. Another important thing is sometimes if you're doing a passage or you're sailing for several days, you're going to be cooking while you're sailing. So having a galley where you can brace yourself, you know, in this galley you have kind of a horseshoe uh, U shape. So you can brace yourself while you're cooking. And it'll make it, you know, nice and safe for the person that's down below that's doing the cooking. Your nap station is a nice area when you're sailing and you're trying to get out of the weather, you're trying to do some work on, on you know, from inside of the boat. This uh, Genoa 410 has a beautiful nav station, very comfortable sitting. It's facing forward, so uh, it's going to help you with not getting motion sickness if you're prone to that, because you're going to be moving with the boat and you're in line with the boat. So that's going to help you with that particular thing. Here you have the radio and you have tank monitors, your panel. And you can add a chart plotter uh, or put a chart plotter station here so you can control what's happening up on top. Now, the Genoa 410 is a dual helm boat. Now, it doesn't mean that you have a spare. Uh, it means that you have two wheels to control the rudders. So as you turn, you know, a wheel, they both match. So if I turn this wheel, you can see that one moving. So it's all coordinated. It doesn't mean you have a spare. It's just... Because the boat is so wide, on the aft portion, when you sit down to sail, you want to be able to see what's happening around the sails. So by sitting as far to the edge as possible, you're going to be able to monitor what's happening up here. Now, something I love about this design is that they took what I'm going to call the cat catamaran ramp. So instead of having to... Uh, having a, a weather deck that's even with the cockpit. Um, so basically you have to step from the cockpit to the side here and into the weather deck. They gave you a ramp. So basically if I'm coming from the back side, I don't have to jump over anything. I just keep walking. Plenty of handrails to hang on to. And I get to my shrouds here but I have easy access to move forward on the boat if I have to come here to deal with a spinnaker uh, or with the anchor at any given point 
So that was a very nice thing that uh, Juneau did with their design of uh, this particular boat and also on the 49, they have the same ramp. So it makes it very easy to work your way up without having to climb over uh, the backside, the, you know, the combing on the cockpit. On the sail plan for this boat, you're gonna notice that this is an in-mess roller furling system for your main. Now, don't get fooled by the stories and the naysayers. They work perfectly fine. Uh, you know, usually if there's a problem with one of these, it's because it was uh, user error or poor maintenance, one or the other. It had nothing to do with the design of the system. The nice thing about the setup is that it's gonna give you a limited um, reefing points so you can make the sail very small if you're in heavy weather or you can take it all the way to the back to give you uh, plenty of canvas for light wind conditions so very nice design um, this here is uh, you know when with the low friction rings uh, instead of using blocks like on the the standard boats so it's a nice design as using Dyneema to build a frame and then they use low friction blocks um, to create the, the loops to give you line controls. So this is for your uh, sheets on your head sail. One thing they did good and bad uh, on this particular boat is that they went aft with the shrouds. So that is fantastic. When you have this cables on the outside uh, it gives you room to walk through the weather deck without having to hit your head or without having to dock to get under the water. But they put the secondary shroud coming right across the weather decks. So the catch is, this is great because it's out of the way. This one, not so great because it's dead smack in the middle. So when you're walking down the weather deck, you have to dock to get under it in order to keep going aft to the cockpit. So, you know, if you're listening to this, uh, find a different arrangement for that secondary. Another nice thing that you know did with uh, this model boat is they went to the low profile hatches. So these hatches are flat with the deck. So you're not gonna stub your toe or trip over them. So they're not a trip hassler. And you have a solar trickle charger for your batteries. They went with a steep angle on the Dodger, which is good for having the spray run off uh, when you're uh, going to weather. As you walk down, they added a handhold to hang on as you're walking down the ramp on the weather deck uh, back to the cockpit. Now this particular boat has a lot of mechanical assists meaning you're gonna have a lot of things that are gonna help you manage the boat and stretch your sailing line. So it's gonna have bow thrusters. You're gonna have your anchor windlass back here. You have an electric windlass for your sheets, which is this one right here. You have your electronics when you're docking. You have your engine control and shifter here. So you're always gonna be docking from the starboard side of the boat. In here, you're gonna see that they have uh, an electronic hydraulic system for the platform to so take it up or down. The cockpit lights, ambient lights, table light, and there's a 12 volt um, car charger there. And you have the same ramp also on the port side. And you have also the electric um, winch for your sheets. You also have a electric primary winch so a lot of mechanical assistance. So it should be pretty easy to navigate this boat um, and single hand the boat using all of these levers that now you have available. The platform on the boat, like in all Juno's, opens up, goes flat and gives you a nice uh, swim platform and you have your swim ladder. This boat has the davit for your dinghy. Now, if some people like to have the dinghy back here. Uh, some people like to put the dinghy up on the forward deck when you're sailing. Usually, I prefer having it on the forward deck. If you take seas from the stern of the boat, uh, this uh, could be dangerous as it can come in into the cockpit area. So better to have it 
forward and have it back here when you're sailing. All right, folks, so let's talk a little bit about the numbers. This boat comes with a 140 gallon water tank. Now, water consumption when you're on a boat is very important because you have a limited resource, you want to take care of it. So on average, the a male person, a man, should consume about a gallon of water per day. Women, they recommend seven tenths of a gallon per day. Let's just round it to everybody drinks a gallon per day. When you're taking showers, the way I described it earlier, let's say every person uses maybe, you know, a, a little bit of a gallon of water or less. Uh, for dishwashing, which, you know, you cook, you got to wash the pots and pans, you got to wash the, uh, the dishes, you do it the same way you take a bath. You use salt water to get all the cleaning done and you use fresh water for the final rinse and then you put it away. So on average, a person is going to consume about three and a half gallons of water per day. So if I have 140 gallons of water and I have three and a half gallons of consumption, that's roughly going to give me about 40 days of capacity with that consumption ratio. Now, if it's two people, then it's going to be twice as much. So you're going to have only about 20 days of range with the water that you carry on the boat. Now, when we talk about fuel, and fuel is going to be different depending on the size of the engine, how much weight there is, um, you know, the, the wind conditions, the current. So what I'm giving you is a very basic example. This boat comes equipped with a 52.8 gallon, uh, 52.8 gallon fuel tank. Uh, on average, if you're running the boat, you know, you're not trying to gun it, you're running at average cruising speed, let's say about six, seven knots, you're probably going to be consuming about 0 0.8 gallons per hour. So if you take your 52.8 gallons divided by your uh, 0.8 consumption, it's going to give you about 66 hours of running time on that capacity. Now, if you're doing six knots, uh, you're basically making six nautical miles per hour. Uh, again, I'm generalizing. Uh, but let's say that on average you make six, six nautical miles per hour times 66 hours. That's going to give you a range of about 396 nautical miles. So if I'm going from Florida to Spain and I think I'm going to be, you know, running on engine a portion of the time, that's a lot longer than 396 um, nautical miles. I probably want to take some additional fuel on Jerry Jogs uh, just as a spare, just in case. But for the most part, I will try to sail as much as possible to conserve. Let's talk about the holding tank situation. So everybody has to use the head, right? And using information I got from the uh, RV crew, which they, they're pretty good on their measurements, uh, they claim that you, you use about two gallons on your holding tank per person per day. Why? Because it's not just what you're putting in, it's also you have to flush it. Uh, so, and that's gonna consume some water. So that water is gonna go into the tank and that's gonna occupy space. This boat comes equipped with 50.1 gallons of uh, holding tank capacity. So roughly at two gallons uh, per day per person, one person would be able to continue to use the tank without pumping it out for about 25 days. If you have two people on the boat on the same capacity, you're going to have about 12 days, 12, 13 days. Now, if you're cruising outside of the three mile uh, limit, meaning that you're going offshore three miles or more, you go into international waters, you can change your valve so your waste goes straight overboard. And if you have a macerator pump, you can pump your tanks overboard at that point. You cannot do that if you're inside of three miles in inland or coastal waters. So that means that if you're going around the intercoastal, if you're going around the coast of Florida, you have to keep it on the holding tank until you get to a facility where you can have it pumped out. The other thing that provides limits on a boat is your refrigerator. This boat comes with a 6.3 cubic foot uh, refrigerator, uh, roughly, and a consumption of, say, a quarter of a cubic foot per day per person, uh, let's say with a single person, that's going to give you about 25 days that you can carry on the refrigerator. Uh, if it's two of you, then figure is going to be about 12 to 13 days. Now, the reason you have to be smart about your uh, groceries and your, your food stores is 
because of the limited space, you don't want to get things that are big. You don't want to buy a gallon of milk. You want to buy milk that doesn't need refrigeration. You may want to buy powdered milk. Uh, instead of buying a gallon of orange juice, you may buy the small concentrate. So basically you're making it and you're using it. Um, and you don't have to, you know, uh, store it in a big container that takes a lot of space. So you have to plan your grocery shopping so you have more dry goods and more canned goods that you're going to take with you on your trips. If, you're, if you have limited space, as I showed you earlier on the freezer, that means you're not going to be able to store a, a bunch of meat in there. So you have to plan what kind of meat you want to carry with you. And if you're going to be fishing, then you know you fish, you catch, you clean, you eat, and you start all over again the next day. So it's going to give you uh, longevity or give you more time at sea if you're doing some of those things. So those are some of the considerations um, when it comes to by the numbers. Now, different boats are going to have different capacities. So I'm going to share the, the sheet that I use to come up with the numbers. And you basically put in the, the capacity of the uh, tanks for the boat that you're looking at, and that'll give you a rough idea of what the range could be for that boat. If you're a person that you're going to be at sea in just a couple of days, you know, two, three, four days, and then you're going to be hitting a marina, then it doesn't become a big challenge because you can top off your water, top off your full, and pump out your head. So you're basically resetting the clock on your trip and your capacity. So just some food for thought. So the last section by the numbers, looking at, you know, if, if you saw my video on whether the boat is a blue water cruiser or not. Sales area to displacement ratio of 20.68 indicates a high performance boat, usually based on the on sailboat data calculation. The between 16 and 20 indicates a reasonable good performance. The comfort ratio is measuring the the motion and comfort so a boat that moves really fast is going to be less comfortable for the average person so this boat has a 22.1 and between 20 and 30 indicates more of a coastal cruiser from a comfort standpoint so the capsize screening formula delivers a 2.02 .02, and what this is measuring is beam versus displacement a boat that has a, a larger beam that contributes to capsizing versus a heavy displacement reduces the capsizing, so it's comparing those two. Uh, a boat that is has a rating of 2.0 has a better is better suited for ocean passages versus coastal cruising. So for this boat being right at 2.02, uh, based on this rating, I would say is probably uh, right at the borderline of whether it's a, a good for ocean passages or for coastal cruising. Now, because this boat is built in Europe, uh, there's a European rating. And based on the European rating, and see A, B, C, and D rating. A rating is primarily for um, ocean passage boats that can take winds in excess of uh, force eight on the Beaufort scale, 40 knots roughly, uh, which is a gale, and moderately high seas, you know, with waves somewhere between 18 and 25 feet. So the boat is rated uh, for ocean passage with a load of six passengers or coastal cruising with a load of seven passengers on a two cabin model. For the three cabin model, it's rated for ocean passages with up to eight passengers and for coastal cruising with up to 10 passengers. But with that, I mean, the, I would say this is something I would feel comfortable uh, and go in sailing long distance with. And is a boat that is very well equipped and can handle at least two weeks at a shot. So, so with that, folks, thank you so much for watching. We're going to be doing similar episodes on different size boats. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. We're, we have a Janot 349, which we're going to be doing it. I'm going to do it on my own boat, uh, Reverie, which is a Pearson 34. It's an older boat. Uh, we'll do it on a Catalina, and we'll do it on a Lagoon Catamaran. So you have an idea of how to look at the analysis of the boat and come up with the right answer for you. If you post comments or questions on the comment section below, please subscribe to our channel. We are sharing all this information free of charge to help you make your uh, decisions on your boat selections or boat projects. You know, we did a lot of work on Reverie and we'll, I'll talk about Reverie on one of the episodes. So with that, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.